Algebra 2, Unit 8, Lesson 2, Exponential Function Applications. In this lesson, we want to use exponential growth and decay functions to model real-life situations and then use those to find different values for that function. So I'll remind you that the general form is y is equal a times b to the power x, where b is a positive number. It shows growth if b is bigger than 1 and decay if b is a fractional value between 0 and 1. The initial value is a, and b is either the growth or the decay factor. If we are given a percent of increase or decrease in something, that's related to the growth or decay factor, r being the rate of change or the percent of how it changes. b is 1 plus that. So if b is bigger than 1, r has to be a positive number, which is the rate of increase, and r will be a positive value, b being then the growth factor. If it's between 0 and 1, we know that this has to be now a decay factor, meaning I had to subtract something from the 1. So r was the rate of decrease, and r is a negative value. This will be, it will say a percent increase, this would say a percent decrease, or it's declining, and then b is called the decay factor. So in the first example, we have a world population that in 2000 was about 6.08 billion. The annual rate of increase was about 1.26%. What is the growth factor for the real world population? Well, first we have to take this rate and change it into a decimal, where you divide by 100, or you move the decimal two places to the left, giving you 0 0.0126. Then the growth factor b, because this is an increase, this was a positive value, we will always add that to whatever b is. Here we're adding a positive value so it gets bigger. So b is now 1.012 to the 6. If the rate of increase continues to be that, right, if we want to write a function to model that, then we'll let x be the year since 2000, x being our starting point for looking at it, and then we would put 6.08 times our b, 1.0126 to the power a, this number being the initial population. And since it was in billions, we can just write billions at the side instead of writing 6.08 billion as a. If I wanted to find what would be the population in, say, 2020, that's 20 years since then, so you would put 20 in this function to see what the population would be in 2020. A new car that sells for 18000 depreciates, meaning goes down 25% each year. If we want to write a function that models that, well, since it's depreciating, this will now be a negative change. So that's a negative 0 0.25, where again, we took that 25 and divided by 100, or moved the decimal two places to the left. And then B, we would take 1 plus that to give 0 0.75. The function then, which is the value at time t, is our initial value of 18,000 times that decay rate, 0 0.75 raised to the power t. What is the value of the car after four years? Well, this is a time t, so we put the t in here for four and get v of four. The value after four years is 18,000 times 0.75 to the power four which is about 5695, or the car's value would be about $5,695. In how many years would the value of the car be 3000 Well, now we're actually given a value of the car, which is a y value, which goes on this part of the equation. So we would take the 3000 and put it here into v of t, and then we want to solve for the value of t. So 3,000 would be 18,000 times 0.75 to the power t. Now we could keep trying values to estimate what that would be. It's not very effective. We can also make this question easier by, in terms of graphing it, which we're going to do on our graphing calculator, by taking that and dividing each side by 3,000 so that we don't have to make the window quite so big. But we're going to do what? We're going to put in each side of that equation, and then we will graph that to find the point of intersection. I'm first going to put in my exponential function in the reduced form, so I'm going to do 6 times 0 0.75 to the power x, and then my other function is a 1, and we'll see if it will intersect from minus 1 to 1, so I'm going to graph both of those. There's my decay function, and there's my 1. 
and we do see the point of intersection. If we hadn't, we would have had to increase the x's or the y's, depending on what we can't see. And then we want to calculate what that point of intersection is. So I go to option 5, which is intersect. It says be on the first curve. In case there was more than one intersection point, you would want to cl move close to the point of intersection. You just hit enter when it says first curve. It says second curve. You hit enter. And it says, do you want to guess? And you do, so put enter. And it will tell you that the intersection point is right there when the x is 6.228 and the y is 1, which now gives us the, the time to one decimal was 6.2, meaning in 6.2 years, the value of the car would only be $3,000. Two special applications of exponential functions are a half-life and compounding interest. So a half-life is the amount of time it takes a radioactive substance to become half. So if you started with 30 grams of it, the half-life would be how much time it would take to get to 15 grams, which then would be the same amount of time it would take it to get to 7.5 grams, which would then be the same amount of time it would take that to get to half of that, or 3.75 grams. So the amount of material keeps getting halved each time. The amount of time it takes to do that is the same for radioactive substances. So the function for that is y is equal to whatever initial amount you have times one-half, and then you need the number of half-lives. Well, x is just some general time, and then you have to divide that by the half-life to find out how many half-lives have passed. So mercury-197 is an isotope of mercury used in kidney scans. It has a half-life of only 64.128 hours. Write the exponential decay function for a 12 milligram sample. So the, here I used m of x to mean the amount of mercury after time x is equal to 12, which is the initial amount of the sample, and then 1 half, and then whatever time passes divided by that half-life. Find the amount that's remaining after 72 hours, where first of all we should note that that's just a little bit over one half-life, and therefore we should expect just a little under half of that 12 to be left. So we take the 72 and put it in that function. It gives us 1.1227 half-lives that have passed, and 12 times one half to that power is about 5.5 milligrams. If we were to be given when did we want to know, say, when three milligrams was left, which we would put here, we could then determine how many half-lives had passed to do that. Interest is compounded continuously with principal P, the amount originally invested or owes, and then A is the amount currently in the account or owed. If you have simple interest, the current amount that you owe is the simple with 1 plus R to the T. That's not an exponential function, but if you make it compounding where you do it more than once, R is the annual rate, T being the time in years, and N is the number of times it's compounded in those years. So T times N would be the number of total times that it's compounded. So if I left it in five years and it's compounded twice, it would really be compounded 10 times. So we take the overall rate and divide that into and pieces. So if your annual rate is 5% and they compound four times a year, they take that 5% rate and divide that into four parts. So you get 1 plus R over N, and then you raise that to the number of times it's compounded, and you multiply by the original principal P to find out either how much you have or how much you owe under interest. The more frequently the interest is compounded, the more quickly the amount A increases from the principal. Of course, interest is haram in Islam, and the reason is that it, the amount that you owe keeps going up and up, and even if you're on the receiving end, it's not acceptable because someone else then is owing more and more to you. Banks will also compound continuously, in which case A is equal to P times a, a number E to the RT, where E to the X is a value on your calculator here on mine above this LN button where it says e to the x. 
E is an irrational number, 2.718-2818, and those eights don't repeat. So suppose you owe $5,000 at an annual rate of 6.9% and you're compounding monthly. How much would you owe in 10 years if you don't pay anything off? So you start off owing $5,000. How much would you pay in 10 years at a 6.9% rate? Well, the rate, take that and divide by 100, is 0 0.069, and they're compounding monthly, so they would divide that by 12. You add that to 1, gives you this rate. How many times is it compounded in those 10 years? Well, they do it monthly, so 12 times 10 is 120 times of compounding. So you would take 5,000 times that rate, raised to the one power 120, is gives you almost double what you owed in that time. So if you couldn't pay anything off, you now end up owing about double what you started with. How much more would you owe if interest were compounded continuously? Well, 12 is quite often, so it won't be a big difference between that and continuous. Again, what do you do? You simply take the 5,000 and then E times that same rate, 0 0.069 to the power T. If you now put in your 10 years into that, that would give you 0 0.69, giving a round $20 more.